Distinguished Kennedy School of Government alumni, faculty, and staff, friends and supporters from far and wide, participants of the 2006 Black Policy Conference, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> a little more than a year ago, on some April 8, 2005, we brought to you the inaugural Black Policy Conference at Harvard University. Nicole Campbell brought to order a conference with the goal, and I quote, stating, to provide for sustainable public service leadership component. That event was an incredible success, and upon that event, we have built today's foundation. Today, April the 21st, 2006, we're a little older, we're a little wiser, and a little bit more experienced. But today, our goal needs to be larger than creating a sustainable network of black public service leaders. We, in fact, must find sustainable solutions. We take that network and move forward. It is at this moment, it is at this time that we do this. We cannot simply say that we came to a conference today and attended some speakers and some events and went home. In fact, the goal must be to go to our places where we've come from, our NGOs, our public sector um, communities, and, and, and our federal and state governments, and leave with sustainable solution. We must inspire to lead, maybe from the words of the distinguished Assistant Secretary of State, from the distinguished um, District Attorney Kamala Harris, from um, Congressman Kendrick Meek, from Hill Harper, John Hope Bryan, and many of the other participants that we have today, but you must return home ready to lead. So again, as we said, um, we welcome you to this conference. I want to take a moment now just to introduce someone who, without which this, none of this would be here, one of the most inspiring people who I've ever met, and frankly, um, somebody you will all be reading about <laughs> in about 10 years. Um, Queen Noor Sara Quinn. Thank you, Brandon, but I'm still not paying you for that. <laughs> so as we worked tirelessly to plan the conference, it was important for us not to get lost in the details and lose sight of the purpose and the impetus for the theme that we have, which is bridging the gap. And that theme was inspired um, by the events that happened last fall um, after Hurricane Katrina um, hit the Gulf and really had a dev devastating effect um, on people, especially people of African descent. So it was important for us to remain steadfast in our efforts to bring change to our communities and devote sustained attention to the issues of inequality that we face. So we talked about the theme, um, and we, you know, we, we talked to different people about what we should do. And one of those people was Dean McCarthy, who really gave us um, a lot of encouragement to really pursue this theme. Um, and he believed that it would be, this, would, this conference would be the best place to really focus on, on the events of Katrina and on inequality, and use it as a way to motivate people into action. As Dean of Degree Programs, uh, Joseph McCarthy has been a tireless advocate for students and their activities here at the Kennedy School. From the inception of the conference, Dean McCarthy has supported all of our efforts in extraordinary ways. As students, we cherish the fact that his door is always open to us, and somehow he always makes time to listen to our concerns, even with his very busy schedule. We sincerely appreciate that. There is no question in our minds that this conference would not be a success without his continued support and commitment. I ask that you please join me in welcoming Dean McCarthy as he introduces our keynote speaker, Dr. Jendire Frazier. If I'd known I was going to be publicly embarrassed, I wouldn't have agreed to this, but thank you very much for those very kind words, Queen and Brandon. What, uh, what a couple to have to follow uh, to the podium. Uh, but welcome, let me also welcome you on behalf of the Kennedy School, on behalf of Dean David Elwood, uh, who hopes to join this group a little later this evening. He's tied up at the moment. Welcome to Cambridge, welcome to Harvard, welcome to the Kennedy School of Government, or welcome back uh, in many cases, uh, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, uh, the uh, scene of, of so many interesting evenings and policy discussions. This, as Brandon uh, introduced, is the second annual 
a black policy conference uh, at the Kennedy School, and we are very proud uh, to have a second annual. We look forward to many further annual uh, black policy conferences. Uh, let me just take a moment to um, return the favor and say a nice word or two about uh, the two people who preceded me to the podium, Brandon Hutzbeth and Queen Norisara Quinn. Uh, these two have been tireless. They've been working on this conference since I think the moment the last conference closed last spring. They were working on it all summer. They have worked uh, imaginatively. They have worked uh, cooperatively, and they have been just splendid. They have earned the highest praise I can think of, uh, which is the, uh, to the praise of my staff assistant, uh, my assistant, Aaron uh, Ward, who sees all of the students come and go and said, those two are fabulous, and it's, it's certainly true. Uh, so uh, and I worried a bit because I wasn't sure Queen, with all she was doing, would get to class or anything, but she seems to be on her way to graduate, so this is a good thing. It is indeed an honor, and it's a great personal pleasure to also welcome back to the Kennedy School a friend and former faculty member who has made us very proud of our association with her and who has been a shining example for our students of how one person can make a difference in Washington, even at a fairly early career stage. I first got to know Jendiah Fraser when she was a junior faculty member with an office just around the corner here and just down the hall from mine. In those days, she was trying to teach politics, policy, and leadership to first-year masters in public policy students. I've often wondered if she thought that experience proved good preparation for the rough and tumble of international diplomacy and life in Washington and which of the experiences she has found easier over there. Well, you don't have to answer that, uh, Madam Secretary. In any event, I was very sorry to see her leave Harvard, but there are worse things for a school of government than to have your faculty called away to high positions in a national administration. I, like others, have watched with admiration Secretary Fraser's considerable achievements in Washington and beyond. Please permit me to give just a brief synopsis of her resume. Dr. Fraser holds a BA, an MA, and a PhD degree, and PhD degrees from Stanford University, where I learned she actually studied under uh, Secretary Rice, uh, was her professor at Stanford. Secretary Fraser's dissertation examined civilian military relations in Kenya. Since August of last year, Dr. Fraser has served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Prior to her current post, she was U.S. Ambassador to South Africa, and before that, she served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director of African Affairs at the National Security Council. I think it would be fair to say that no one in the current administration has had a greater role in shaping U.S. policy in this very important part of the world. And I can think of no one better suited to address us on this evening's topic, transformational diplomacy in U.S.-Africa relations. Secretary Fraser, welcome home. Well, good, e good afternoon to all of you. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, Brandon and Queen for the invitation. I feel very honored, and Joe, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I have been asked to keep my remarks to 20 minutes, and I think I'm going to try my best to keep them even shorter because I think the real value of uh, my being here is in our conversation together. Um, rather than my, you know, talking to you. Uh, and I'm, I'm not so sure about my topic. I'm s still trying to understand why I was invited, but I do, again, I do really uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, 
especially to be here in the forum uh, with, with its great history of promoting dialogue and debate. And I would imagine that this afternoon will be no different. And also uh, dealing with some of the world's uh, greatest challenges, um, most difficult challenges, and certainly today's topic of bridging the gap focused on socioeconomic disparity faced by people of African descent is a worthy uh, topic for the forum's traditions of serious intellectual inquiry. What I'd like to do is really present the case of how the United States' Africa policy is helping to bridge the gap in Africa. And particularly, I want to highlight uh, the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice's uh, notion or approach to transformational diplomacy and the President's vision as articulated in a national security strategy on how we hope to promote uh, freedom, prosperity, peace, working with a community of democracies to address transnational threats and take advantage of today's opportunities. So the first thing I'd like to do is interrogate the picture of Africa that's commonly portrayed in the media. And that's a picture indeed of death, disease, and dictatorship. And if you look at places like Darfur, Sudan, or even Zimbabwe, then maybe there's some evidence that that is indeed the image of Africa. But I would suggest to you that the gap that has to be bridged is a much smaller one than is commonly portrayed. Um, and I think that, that we, we can ask ourselves, why do we have that persistent, um, persistent and outdated uh, view of Africa, which I b believe perpetuates a stereotype that actually contributes to a, gr a gap of socioeconomic opportunity because it helps to scare away investors and it undermines confidence in Africa. And we need to transform, when we talk about transformational diplomacy, we need to transform from an approach in which there's a call for charity versus an approach in which there's the drawing of investment, an, an attractive continent. I think it's necessary to look at the real trends in Africa. And, we've, we, and if you do look at those trends, I think you'll see that there's great reason for optimism about Africa. The continent is ripe for positive change, many of which are already underway. And just to give you a bit of evidence to this effect, if we look at the democracy front, since 2000, more than two-thirds of sub-Saharan African nations have held democratic elections. Power has changed hands peacefully, most recently in Benin when P President Karakou stepped down um, after Th Thomas Boni Yayi was chosen in a fair election. If you also look at the democracy indicator, one of the toughest critics of democracy, I think, in Africa is Freedom House. And if you look at Freedom House stats, in 1990, it classified only four sub-Saharan African countries as free. 20 is partly free, and 24 is not free out of the 48 countries. In 2006, that was now 11 free, up from four, 23 partly free, and only 14 not free. So 34 of the, one of the toughest critics um, of democracy is showing that the trend lines are quite positive, not quite the picture of dictatorship that you often hear. If you look on the peace front, in the last five years, we've seen violence yield to peaceful negotiations in six countries that were previously dismissed as intractable. I believe that by engaging, the Bush administration has made a difference in the lives of millions of men, women, and children in Angola, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and in ending the 22-year conflict in Sudan, the North-South conflict, which led to over 2 million people um, dying. So all of these changes are part of an historic shift. And that historic shift is one in which Africans are taking leadership of their continent through the African Union and its new partnership for Africa's development and its program of, of action. So I believe that Africans are implementing better governance across the continent. They're 
creating the conditions for peace and prosperity. And that's really the picture. And so when you talk about bridging that gap, the, the, one of the fundamental approaches of the Bush administration is to look to African leadership and back it and support it. As you may know, uh, Secretary Rice has coined a term called transformational diplomacy, which she's used to describe her foreign policy approach. And the guiding principle of that approach is partnership as opposed to paternalism, the paternalism of the past. It's an activist philosophy that calls for more doing, more doing with people, and less reporting on them. I recently returned from a trip to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and I absolutely saw transfer, transformational diplomacy in, 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 in operation there. This is a country that in 2000 and 2001, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Namibia, were all involved in what was a, a civil war. There were three, four different rebel groups, the um, uh, Moving for Liber uh, the MLC, the RCD. The, I, I only know their initials these days. I don't even know what the, the names stand for, but there's just an alphabet soup of rebel groups in Congo. I sat not three weeks ago in Goma, which used to be a place for bloodbath. I moved around in Kisangani. Commerce is returning. People are optimistic. Um, we have seen transformational diplomacy. As Secretary Rice says, transfor transformational diplomacy is about doing things with people, not for them. The Secretary has explained that we seek to use America's diplomatic power to help foreign citizens better their own lives and to build their own nations and to transform their own futures. So I believe that this concept accounts for what is really a geopolitical shift since the end of the war Cold War. And what we're seeing is the rise of new strategic partners, new strategic powers amongst Africa's uh, 48 countries. Nigeria and South Africa have used their diplomatic economic and military power to shape the continent for the better. Angola and yes, Equatorial Guinea have access to significant, significant oil revenues at $72 a barrel that can be used to transform their societies with engagement, with pushing, with encouragement. Mali, Madagascar, Mozambique, Lesotho, Benin and others are leading the way in showing the world the power of democratic freedom. So in this changing world, with this changing picture of Africa's uh, leadership, how do we address some of the challenges that have uh, been longstanding? Uh, the challenges of dealing with uh, wars, the challenges of dealing with poverty, the challenges of dealing with the health crises, whether it be HIV and AIDS pandemic, malaria and others as well as the more fundamental challenge of, of uh, freedom, of individ individual freedom and societal freedom through the transformation to democracy. And that's what I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about in, in the next 10 minutes. I'll try to be quick, but I want to tell you how I see the Bush administration bridging that gap in all of these areas of challenge. On peace and security, as I said, over the last six years, six wars have ended in Africa. Our approach to ending those wars is in each and every single case, we've worked with an African mediator. Some country, one or two countries have been the lead mediator. We've stood behind that mediation. Um, then we've worked with the sub-regional organizations helping to build their capacity. And then we've worked with the United Nations often to get a peacekeeping operation on the ground to support uh, the ending of a war. I'll give you just a couple of examples. In uh, Sudan, with the North-South Agreement, uh, we backed the mediation of Kenya. Uh, we worked with EGAD, sub-regional organization. And when we got the North-South Agreement, we worked with the United Nations to put the UN mission in Sudan there, UNMIS mission, which has about 7,000 forces there. That's instructive, and I'm going to leave it to the Q&A because I know I'm going to be asked about Darfur. But that approach is instructive to what we're trying to do in Darfur. 
If you take Liberia, which is also, I think, a shining example of what we're trying to accomplish. In Liberia, the United States worked with the, the uh, International Contact Group for Liberia, which was made up of the U.S., but mainly uh, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. We worked very closely with them in terms of mediating um, agreement between uh, the Charles Taylor government, the Modell rebels, the Lurd rebels, and your, your, your general civil society group, of which um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who used to be a student here, um, was part of that broader democratic or uh, domestic uh, political opposition groups. So we worked with the sub-regional organizations on the mediation. Ghana was a lead mediator. We backed Ghana's mediation. Nigeria and the United States put the first forces on the ground that helped to end the, the, um, the attack of Lerda and Model on the capital. Um, Nigeria took Charles Taylor to, to give peace a chance, essentially, and now we see uh, Africa's first female president. Th those first forces with uh, the U.S. and Nigeria, when we came out, Ghana and other um, West African countries took over the peacekeeping, and then that was rehatted and blue-helmeted to be a U.N. Uh, peacekeeping operation, UNMIL, which is about 15,000 today. So the point here is there is a consistent approach. I could go through Congo. Congo, the lead mediator was South Africa. We're working very closely with Manuk. But, but crisis after crisis, we've seen success. Institutionalizing that requires resources. And what we've done is developed a program called the Global Peace Operations Training Initiative, which provides $660 million over five years to train 40,000 peacekeepers. These are global peacekeepers concentrated in Africa with the intent of having peacekeepers for Africa, building that capability of the African nations, the sub-regional organizations, and even beyond that internationally. So that's on the peace and security front. Closing the gap of war, we've done so. Six wars, we've got at least three more that are, are raging. Uh, LRA, LRA is a real problem probably is a silver bullet uh, answer. Um, we have Darfur, much, much, much more complex. We need to build an international coalition to achieve results there. And then we have Cote d'Ivoire, and I think that that's on a real positive dynamic. And then you have the Chad situation with Sudan, which is part of the Darfur complexity. So there are some more wars, and then, I'm sorry, we also have to mop up the eastern part of the Congo. I was sitting in Goma, but I knew just, just down from me there were uh, FDLR, what are called negative forces, sitting in the force there. We've got to go and get those guys. Um, so there, there's, there's more work to be done, but I think we've made tremendous progress. Now let's look very quickly on the economic front, on the economic growth. Our strategy for bridging this gap is to level the playing field internationally, particularly with the Bretton Woods institutions. First, uh, one area is uh, debt cancellation. Uh, President Bush, in June 2001, he went to the World Bank and he said, we've got to stop the debt. We've got to stop the debt by providing the poorest countries with grants rather than loans. Then in June 2005, even before that, but in June 2005, we achieved debt cancellation, 100% debt cancellation for 18 of the eligible HIPAA countries, of which 14 of those 18 were from Sub-Saharan Africa, costing about 40 billion globally. We are pushing for 100%, and we have pushed for 100% debt cancellation of the World Bank, Africa Development Bank, and IMF debts and the U.S. routinely, those are multilateral debts, the U United States routinely uh, cancels 100% of its own bilateral debt to HIPAA countries. So leveling the, leveling the playing field by getting rid of what is called odious debt and not contributing to new debt by providing all new assistance to the poorest countries in the form of grants. Secondly, let's look at the trade. That's really the sustainable aspect of economic growth. We're trying to do that through the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, which opens the U.S. markets to African products. Um, 37 countries of the 48 are part of the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. It's basically giving them access to our markets for, I think it's 
6,400 or so tariff lines. Um, so it also helps to diversify their economies. So providing opportunities and access to the market, but we also know that most African countries have uh, based their economies on agriculture. It's the largest sector of many of these countries. So what we need to do is in export uh, agricultural subsidies and to reduce trade distorting barriers. Uh, we've, called very, uh, we've called for this, uh, we're pushing for it, but we want to do it within the context of the World Trade Organization. Because the problem is if we got rid of all of our ag subsidies and the Europeans, especially the French, kept their ag subsidies, it would put all our farmers out of work. And we don't want to do that. We're saying let's all do it simultaneously. Let's get rid of all of the uh, agricultural export subsidies. Then if we look on the assistance side, we're trying to increase our development assistance and use that development assistance to uh, inspire reform in countries. Uh, we've got a new program, the Millennium Challenge Account Country, which was $5 billion over three years, specifically focused on countries that are ruling justly, investing in health and education, and uh, pr promoting economic, uh, economic opportunity, economic growth. Good, good economic governance. Most of the countries that are part of the Millennium Challenge account so far are African. Our aid to Africa has gone up to $4.6 billion last year. When I started in the administration, our aid to Africa was $700 to $800 million. We had mobilized a national summit on Africa to push for more U.S. assistance to Africa, and our aim at that time was $1 billion. We're now at $4.6 billion, but we know that assistance alone is not going to contribute to Africa's development. It's not going to, to, to reduce that gap. What we need are the total flows, aid, fair trade, foreign direct investments, remittances, domestic savings, private philanthropy. We need to look at all sources of capital flow into Africa. If we go uh, quickly to health and education, I don't, I'm not going to go into detail on this. You know that we have a, what was really a revolutionary initiative, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which for the first time brought treatment, uh, gave access to treatment to uh, many Africans who did not have access to the antiretroviral drugs, but it's trade, it, I'm sorry, it's treatment, it's prevention, and it's a care program, and it was $15 billion over five years. We also have a new malaria initiative, $1.2 billion with the intent of reducing mortality by 50% in 15 countries in Africa. So we're trying to help Africa help itself, um, particularly investing in its greatest resources, which is its own people. Health and education is critical to the development of Africa. Uh, finally, underlying all of this is the need for greater freedom. Uh, civil society is the engine of growth and development, accountability of governments to their own population. And so we're trying to build democracies. And when I talk about conflict resolution, most people talk about uh, moving from conflict resolution to post-conflict transition, post-conflict reconstruction. I don't want to do that. That's, that's not the in, ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is the consolidation of democratic institutions so that you can avoid conflict in the future. We're not trying to have sort of patchwork uh, solutions that last for five years. So democratic uh, transformation is the ultimate objective of all of our initiatives. Uh, and what we're going to do in the next three years, while I'm still Assistant Secretary, if I am still Assistant Secretary over the next three years, is really focus on building institutions, independent national electoral commissions that can be the, uh, the neutral mediator between opposing forces, whether they are the, the domestic opposition or the sitting government. You need a body that can conduct that election in a way that's fair and transparent and that gives confidence to the population that their vote will actually uh, be, uh, will, will actually have meaning. Our strategy, therefore, just moving towards conclusion, is we're trying to nurture strategic allies, uh, countries like South Africa and Nigeria that have tremendous reach across their continent. We're trying to invest in success, good reforming countries through our Millennium Challenge account. 
We're trying to leverage regional institutions, build their capability, ECOWAS, uh, EGAD, the African Union itself, the SADC countries. And we do need, there are some countries that just aren't getting it, and we need to contain failing states. I don't think that Africa has many failing states, but one that is certainly failing is uh, Zimbabwe right now. And until we can build the regional coalition to put pressure for a return to democracy in Zimbabwe, we're going to be in a position of having to contain that, that state. So local involvement is central. Uh, building institutions is central. And working in support of African leadership is central. I think we've come a long way. I think the people of Africa have come a long way. If you're talking about bridging a gap, I think we've done quite a lot of it over the last six years. I think we have to institutionalize that progress. But I, uh, just to say once again, am, I'm, I'm not in a situation of despair. <laughs> I think that we actually, uh, the continent is extremely promising. And I actually, and just in, as a final statement, which is outside my own portfolio, I think that that change of mentality to be able to actually see the progress that's taking place is extremely important for all that we're trying to do in terms of closing or bridging the gap of people of African descent worldwide. Because when you, when you, when you have a picture of Africa that says that it's miserable, it, it, it has a psychic effect on all of us. And so we've got to really challenge that image you know, and if it's true, it's true. In Zimbabwe, that economy is failing. But if it's not true, it's not true. Across Africa, economies are growing, democracies are prospering, um, and people are thriving. So I think that our, we can be very proud of the role that we're playing right now. There's obviously much more to be done, but that more to be done has to be done from a position a partnership and not a position of paternalism. Thank you. Secretary, uh, you've given us a lot to think about, and as you know, uh, it is our custom here at the Kennedy School uh, in each forum event uh, to entertain questions uh, from the floor and, uh, and also from the, the mezzanine, and we have microphones uh, here on the floor and two each up there in the mezzanine, and uh, our, our members of our family here know that it is the custom to keep the questions short and to introduce yourself uh, before you ask the question. Uh, and uh, so we will begin uh, right here to the left and then work our way around to uh, this gentleman here on the right. So, sir. Uh, my name is Komen Edu and I'm, and I'm an MPP1. And um, at next Friday is uh, African Night 2006, which will be right here in the forum at 6 o'clock. Um, we'll be uh, talking about doing business in Africa. And I'd like to know what trends you see so far in terms of direct investments by Americans in um, Africa, specifically private capital? Sure, thank you very much. I think, again, the investment that's going to Africa is not sufficient or at the levels that one would expect given the opportunities that are on the continent. And that's why I said that the image that Africa, that's being portrayed is actually scaring away investors. Uh, a, a country like South Africa, which has a strong rule of law, uh, so your investment is safe, is not actually you know, reaping it. The main investor across the continent is actually South African investment. So I think that we can do a lot more. We're going to try to, as the United States government, we're holding uh, an Africa Growth and Opportunity Act forum in the beginning of June, the first week of June. And there we have private sector forum and NGO forum, and we hope to unleash a private sector entrepreneurial um, initiative. I've talked about these big numbers in other areas. That's the last part of our policy that we feel, well, it's not the last part, obviously, but it's, it's in terms of the economic picture, that's a part that's still undone. 
So I think that there are many, many opportunities. Most of the investment, to answer your question directly, is going towards uh, mineral resources, you know, whether that's oil or whatever. Um, and, it's, it, and what we need to do is get capital into smaller entrepreneurs. What's this forum? I'm sorry. So it's the Africa Growth and Opportunity Forum. Where is it going to be? I'm sorry. It's, it's going to be in Washington, D.C. So just look at the State Department website, state.gov, www.state.gov, um, and hit on Africa, and you should see a GOA. Thank you. Talk about the forum. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Hertz, and I'm an MPA student in international development. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for coming. On behalf of all African students, we're really honored to have you here. Uh, my question is with regard to prospects of democracy for Ethiopia, actually, where you've been asked a lot of questions recently. Uh, last year in December, you actually stated that uh, you're going to continue to hold the Ethiopian government accountable for what happened during the post-elections demonstrations. And um, my question is, can you give us an update on what the government is doing and how you're continuing to pressure um, the government of Mala Zenawi? And are you satisfied with the way he's handled the uh, judicial process, if any? Uh, one of the things you said is that you would demand a free and transparent judicial process. Um, so in light of what happened, and in light of the fact that, you know, the three very important elements of democracy, which is civil society, an independent media, and a vibrant opposition, all three are being put down in Ethiopia. I'd like to get your update on the situation. Sure, thank you. Uh, first, the, the situation is not at all um, simple. Let me put it that way. And the opposition is not at all unified with the same motivations. Now, that said, what has happened there is that the, obviously, during that election aftermath, there was many more people who were elected from the opposition and in Addis Ababa in particular, including the mayor of Addis Ababa, they felt that the election had been stolen. And so it's the legitimate right of people to have demonstrations. What has happened in, in, in Ethiopia is that many of those demonstrators are now in jail. Uh, and many, and when I've talked to Melis, and I've, and I've, I've you know, obviously I've, I've gone to Addis and I've had a chance to engage him we have a charge there that engages him every single day. My deputy assistant secretary engages him. We keep, we are pushing on him allowing those people to, to, to let those people out of jail. Now, his, he's insisting that, one, he's done that before, and, well, he insists that there are different types of people in jail. There's legitimate democratic opposition, which have access to the courts. Well, not fast enough. Right? It, not fast enough. They should, they should have access to trials immediately, not delayed. Um, secondly, he says there are the foot soldiers, young kids who've been um, pressured to throw rocks, you know, to do civil disobedience. Probably some are. Uh, but those kids should be out of jail, right? They should be out of jail. If you understand that they're pawns, uh, why are you keeping them in jail? And then there's legitimate democratic opposition that's in jail. And you have to distinguish, he, his thing is that many of those people who are legitimate democratic opposition are actually trying to overthrow the regime. They don't just want their seats in parliament. And there, it is complex. There is evidence that there are some people who want to overthrow the regime. There's also evidence that there are some who want to take their seats in parliament and there's evidence that there's some who feel that their source of financing won't allow them to take their seats in parliament. But again, you have to distinguish. You have to have um, them go to court uh, quickly. I asked him the question, if you're jailing people, what right do they have if their case is dropped to sue the government? What recourse do they have, their reputation, their family life, their work life, you know, their, their, their just their human dignity has been taken away by being in jail. So we're putting pressure for him to release people in large numbers, and we don't think it's an acceptable situation. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. And uh, thank you very much, first of all, for a very positive speech. It's really nice to hear somebody highlight all the positive changes that are happening in Africa in so many countries in terms of increased peace, in terms of uh, economic prosperity. 
Um, I'm from Zimbabwe, which unfortunately has been going through a lot of problems over the last uh, six years. And I liked the, the part of your speech where you spoke about how the U.S. engages problematic African countries through mediators on the, con on the continent. Uh, unfortunately, South Africa has been a disappointing mediator with respect to uh, Zimbabwe. What is your perspective on uh, maybe uh, the next most effective strategy in terms of the U.S. engaging and possibly having a positive influence on the situation in Zimbabwe? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that we need to, we, we, it's not just South Africa, we actually need to build support for a more forceful posture amongst the Southern African development community countries, the SADC countries as a whole. South Africa is obviously a lead country and some other countries say they can't do anything unless South Africa uh, acts first. I don't think that's accurate. I think it's the responsibility of each sovereign government to take a position on Zimbabwe. The mistake I think that the United States made at some point was we disengaged from SADC because we were not satisfied with their posture towards Zimbabwe. I don't think we should have done that. I think we should have got in there, stuck with SADC, and pushed them to engage. One of my officials is going to go to Namibia for the next SADC meeting, and we're going to re-engage with SADC because we have many interests, but we also have the issue of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket for the whole subregion. You know, now people are starving. Doesn't make sense. Uh, everyone, I think that they were holding back, thinking that after the next election he was going to win so large, and then he was going to change. Well, clearly he didn't. So that whole strategy is now out the window. So that's one thing, is build the sub-regional, you know, work with the sub-region to try to get that coalition together to put pressure on him for a return to democracy. Secondly, I think we have to continue to support civil society internally um, because it's under attack. And so whether that's through HIV and AIDS programs, whether that's through civic, you know, education programs, however we can sort of bolster up the people of Zimbabwe as we put pressure from the outside. And then finally, I think MDC needs to get itself together. Um, you know, the split in MDC wasn't helpful. Either they're going to split and be two separate organizations and be legitimate opposition, which is fine, or they come back together. But we were sidetracked with that, you know, development of uh, this, this division within the main uh, opposition group. It's okay for them to be two separate oppositions if they can't come together, but what they need to do is focus on supporting the people of Zimbabwe and building that constituency to force, put pressure from within as we work to try to build coalitions to put pressure from without. this question and uh, uh, Madam Secretary again I'll go my, my question will be again on the uh, on Ethiopia as as you may know the Ethiopian government has faced an ongoing outcry over its intimidation arbitrary detention and use of excessive force in Ethiopia after the May 2005 election among others Amnesty International CPJ the European Union Human Rights and in Human Rights Watch have consistently condemned the horrible atrocity. The State Department recently reported on the human rights uh, in Ethiopia also paint an accurate picture of Ethiopian regime disgraced for the basic tenet of civil, uh, civilized governance. On the other hand, you have issued several disturbing comments on the political crisis. On one occasion, you have echoed Mr. Milesinari phrase and criticized the opposition main agenda as the glory of the past. Similarly, on recent interview with the straight, uh, with straight Talk Africa, a VOA program, you referred to the protesters as unemployed and misguided people. What were your evidence for Can making the comment? The question, there are a lot of people waiting and okay. the secretary has to yes. go. And my comment was, what were your evidence for making these comments? I don't remember calling them misguided. I'm sure I probably said some of them were unemployed. That wouldn't be surprising in a major city um, in Africa, but I'm positive I didn't call. I don't remember that either, but I don't, I'm sure I didn't call them uh, misguided. 
What I'm saying is, and this is true of, and I've said this over and over again whenever I'm asked about Ethiopia, is I, I typically don't talk about a particular country when I'm talking about the democracy issues. I'm trying to talk in, in, in a broader term about an approach to democracy. And what I've said over and over again is you need both a responsible government and a responsible opposition. That's what you need. You need, you need both elements pushing for greater freedom for the society as a whole. And so I've gone to Addis, and not only have I met with Prime Minister Mellis, but I've met with many people in the opposition, leaders of the opposition, some of them who were elected in parliament, didn't go, some of them who were in jail, have been released since, some of them who were elected and have gone and still part of the opposition. And so my point in Ethiopia is that, it, that obviously people have to be allowed out of jail. I think that's a human rights violation, frankly. And I think that they should be able to sue their government um, for uh, being jailed in that way. And we have to keep putting pressure on Prime Minister Mellis to allow all those people out of jail. But I also think that you need uh, an opposition that's focused on true democracy, not just getting in power. And that point is made not only about Ethiopia, and it's not about any particular Ethiopian opposition because it's, there's not one Ethiopian opposition, uh, but it's also made more generally in Africa. Independent national electoral commissions, responsible governments, responsible opposition is necessary for the growth of a democracy and freedom in Africa, at least in the three years that I have some time to work on it. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. just very quickly. Uh, unfortunately, my task uh, to keep us on schedule here Secretary Fraser has a dinner to go to, and there's a reception uh, that the Black Policy Conference is holding uh, before she gets to the dinner. So my instructions were to wrap this up at about 6 o'clock. It is now 6 o'clock. What I will do, though, if you can, and this is sort of like being in the MPP core classroom, if you can give us a very quick just word or two what the topic is, and we'll go around the room here, and then maybe you can give some quick answers to that, and then we can move uh, to the reception where there'll be the chance to engage the secretary a little bit okay. more uh, individually. And of course, I'd like to hear you say a word or two on Darfur before we leave. So okay. please. Uh, yes, actually, I was hoping for um, you to respond to a question on Darfur, what's next, and if the student movement is actually working. Got it. So, I, I, and my question is, um, is about uh, the role of Kangemi's forces still in Goma in uh, Eastern Congo, and also the, your assessment of the Chinese role that they're playing in Africa. You know, you can really come back here and teach a course on this. <laughs> <laughs> it's about balancing uh, democratic values and U.S. strategic interests. So, say that again, I'm sorry? The balance between democratic values and U.S. strategic interests in Africa. U.S. Strategic, Strategic. thank you, thank you. Uh, an assessment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa and the, the strategy post uh, in Becky in terms of leadership and what the priority should be. Mr. Plaza, I'll give you the last uh, IOP uh, fellow uh, alumnus. Uh, what is your... Thank you, Dean. Given uh, the history, science has recorded Africa in terms of its contributions to uh, glo global civilization physics and higher disciplines, but it's also been uh, erroneously perceived as one of misery and so forth. My question is, does the administration's policies reflect respect for Africa's glorious past, or does it prey upon exploitation and misery? Okay, we're gonna, we will have to stop there and, and pick up the other questions when we get uh, Secretary Fraser back here next Friday night for Africa. Okay. <laughs> so is that, can you, uh, yeah. just, just briefly, whatever you can Yes, on. on Darfur, what is next? The main uh, next is to try to get a peace agreement in Abuja. We're hoping by the end of this month or shortly thereafter. Um, we've got people in Abuja working that issue. And then secondly, to try to get a UN Security Council resolution that will blue hat the African Union forces there so that we can get it double the size with uh, the capability, logistics, communication, airlift, uh, and uh, uh, planning, uh, and, and intelligence support. And so that's the next. Is the student movement working? Yes. 
um, and it needs to be expanded. What I found is that it's not America. The, the pressure needs to be on other countries. And so we need you to look, hook up with other international student movements to put pressure on governments in Africa, in Europe, so that, that you have this groundswell of pressure. Um, so yes, but link up, do it, do it, do it like the uh, anti-apartheid movement, link up internationally. I mean, that'll help us to put a coalition together to get those elements in place. Uh, Rwanda uh, is not in uh, Goma or uh, Eastern Congo. And in fact, what I was struck by when I was in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I went from there to Burundi to Rwanda. The relationship between the Rwandan government and the Congolese government has never been better. Um, and I think part of that never been better is that the United States has facilitated this communication and dialogue between Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo, and Burundi. In fact, my colleague who took my job at the NSC is right now in Burundi with what we call the Tripartite Plus mechanism where you have the foreign ministers and defense ministers talking and sharing information. And we have in Kisangani a fusion cell which brings the military officers together so that they can share information about the negative forces. Um, and work together to try to deal with these negative forces. So the, the cooperation is, is fantastic. And they're not there uh, militarily. Um, Kabila said they weren't there, and I take that as, uh, as a, it would be hard to tell, though. I can tell you, it's just, that, that border is, um, <laughs> Goma border, it's, it's, it's just a line. It's, it's actually, um, anyway, it's the, the difference between being here and, and being just next door. It's, it's a very porous border. On democracy values and U.S. strategic interests, our, our strategic interests for the first time as defined in the new national security strategy, which took its cue from the president's inaugural address, is that democracy is not only an ideal that we must follow, but it is necessary for U.S. national security interests as well. For the first time, in the past, when the president talked about democracy, he talked about freedom and freedom being an ideal that, you know, it speaks to the, the best of America's ideals. Very rarely had in the past it been linked to American national security. And that linkage, I think you, what you should do is go to the White House website. And you can even look at the national security strategy of 2002 before the war on terror and the national, or before the 9-11 attack, and the national security strategy of 2006. And when I, sh when I read the 2006, I was struck by the sense to which democracy is the objective. It is the goal, and it is the means. <laughs> and it is considered fundamental to U.S. national security um, interest because it's a war of ideas as well as a war of, uh, of, of, of material, of weapons. So read, read the national security strategy and you will see how the two democracy values and strategic interests have been linked um, there. On, uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't quite get that, the, the question on the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission for South Africa. But uh, on respect for Africa's glorious past, or are we praying on it and exploiting it? I don't think either one is really the basis of our engagement for Africa. I think the basis of our engagement are our own sense of our own national interests, as well as our opportunities for engaging partners in Africa. And that that really sets um, our, our policy on Africa. It's, you know, it's certainly true that it's had a glorious past. It's also true that there's been some real problems in the past. Uh, and um, uh, certainly it's the case that we've got to try to build the institutions that will guard against exploitation, whether that exploitation is being done from a global basis or whether it's being done nationally. Thank you very much. There are many definitions of bridging the gap, and this evening you've helped us bridge the gap in our understanding of Africa and bridge the gap between Harvard and Africa, which uh, Ellen uh, 
Johnson Sirleaf has uh, helped do, our graduate, <laughs> and so I was sure you didn't have a copy of this bulletin yet, Absolutely. so I want to make sure that you got one. Thank you for such a splendid kickoff for this year's Black Policy Conference. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Frazier, for those remarks, and thank you also to Dee McCarthy. I'd like to ask members of the steering committee of the Black Policy Conference to please stand and um, join us as we present um, a gift to Ambassador Frazier for her, for her remarks today and for participation in the conference. 